a storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes Hope will arise Death is defeated The King is alive I raise a
search the world But it couldn't fill me In man's empty praise And treasures that fade you that we can worship you. Lord, we thank you that when we encounter difficulty, when we encounter sickness or division or pain, we thank you that our joy is in you. Lord, the Apostle Paul said that he has learned the secret of being content, whatever the circumstances. And Lord, we thank you that because of you, because of you, we can share in that same contentment. Heavenly Father, we worship you this morning and we thank you. In your holy name, amen. Thank you, worship team, for reminding us once again 
that there is nothing better in our lives than having a relationship with Jesus Christ. I also want to thank all of you for being very flexible this week. As you know, we've had some cases of COVID and the elders just didn't feel comfortable uh, having a, uh, a gathering in the church this week. So we decided to take a week off and do live streaming. And we're thankful and we thank you for being flexible to allow us to do that. I ask that you would continue to pray for the elders as they continue to deal with some of these things on a weekly, ongoing basis. Uh, but God is good. Uh, we're seeking his wisdom in a lot of areas and um, we'll continue to do so. Continue to pray for those. Uh, obviously, I cannot give names, but pray for those who are positive with COVID and uh, those who are quarantining as well, those who are on the team. There are some other prayer requests we have that uh, I would ask all of you to write down. If you don't have a piece of paper, uh, grab one. But those of you at home, I would like to ask that you would pray for certain things. There are a lot of uh, things that have happened over this week, and one of them is that Dave Kaiser's father passed away this week. We lift our prayers to Dave and his family and ask that God would bring them comfort. I ask that you would do the same. Also, Jane Nicholas has a resurgence of cancer once again. And as you know, that this has been an ongoing for her and and um, we don't always know why God continues to allow these things to happen, but we know that he's faithful. So I ask that you pray for Jane, Nicholas, and Bill as well. As well as Lowell, who is um, still dealing with his cancer, and for Kathy Berry. Um, keep, keep these people in your prayers. Also, one more. Uh, Matthew and Heidi Grab had a house fire this week and uh, it totally destroyed their home. So they are displaced, and they do not have any of their belongings. Uh, this is obviously a very horrific thing in, going on in their lives. So I would ask that you would um, spend time in prayer for them as well, and maybe we can reach out to them. I'm sure the church is at this point trying to find ways in which we can help. But please pray for, for Matthew and, and Heidi grab as they deal with uh, this very difficult situation in their life. And in fact, I would like us to pray right now, if we could. I just ask that everyone would, if you're at home, just take the time to bow your, bow your head, close your eyes, kneel, whatever uh, posture you desire, but let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning knowing that you are a God who is able to do abundantly beyond all we can ever ask or think. So, Father, we pray with boldness and with confidence this morning that we know that you will work in the lives of these folks that we have shared. I'd ask that you would give comfort to David. Uh, losing a father, I'm sure, is a very difficult thing. The memories that are there, the things that he thinks of. I'm thankful that they were able to have a day in which they could remember his father as they gathered with friends and family. But I pray in the days ahead that you would continue to give him comfort and peace and give him those great memories that he's had with his dad. Father, I pray for, for Jane as well. Uh, this very difficult news in her life is just seems to be ongoing with this cancer and now with uh, some more um, treatments and surgery maybe even Father, we pray that you would give her strength during this time. I pray that she and Bill would just be able to feed on your faithfulness during this time and that they would trust you. And Father, for Lowell and for Kathy as well as they continue to have to deal with their health issues as well. Father, we understand and know that you are the great physician and we know that you love us with a love that we can't even comprehend. So I pray that you would touch Lowell and Kathy in a very special way today. Let them know your love. Let them know your comfort. Let them know that you are there. And especially, Lord, again this morning, we pray for Matthew and for Heidi. What a terrible thing that has happened this week. We don't know why. 
this thing has happened, but Father, you have always a plan. And I know that part of that plan is that you want to use this to strengthen Matthew and Heidi in their faith. I pray that they would be able to cling to you during this time. But Father, it's also an opportunity for the church to respond. That we would show our love and our concern. And that we would do all we can to help them as well. May the body be at work this week. And all of these people that we've lifted up to you this morning, may we reach out to them. May the body be actively involved in loving on them and caring for them. Not just praying, but just actively also being involved as well. I don't know what that looks like, but Father, help us to be doers of your word. And Father, as we look into your word this morning, you're going to teach us about what it means to delight in you, to find our joy in you, Father, it's one thing that we all need in our lives. And what is it that is stealing our joy? We ask that you'd speak to us. We pray for your spirit to guide and direct us in all things today. And we want you to know that we love you. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. So as I was thinking about the topic that we've been, that we started last week, this topic of finding our joy in God, I started contemplating some of the things that, that brought me joy over the years. I remember the things that used to bring me joy before I was a believer, um, things I probably sh I can't share, um, but I know that some of those things... You know, I used to always look forward to Friday nights because it was the end of the week and uh, the weekend was there and I could go out with my buddies and we can spend money on, on booze and other stuff and do other things and, and it was just one of those things that I delighted myself in. I always looked forward to the weekend. But also when I was young, I also delighted in other things. I delighted in sports. I love sports. I was always playing sports. It was baseball, football, soccer, basketball. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. I just delighted in those things. But it's interesting as I was thinking about the things that I used to delight myself in and the things that brought me joy is that those things that used to bring me joy, when I look at them now, not so much. In fact, some of those things that I used to do that brought me joy back then only brings things like pain to me. Like if I were to go out and play a soccer game right now, uh, that would be very uh, uh, um, stupid of me because I would have to uh, pay the consequences of that for a number of days. The same way with basketball, the same with any of these sports that I mentioned. If I tried to go out and do them now, uh, I would be hurting. So I don't find joy in those things anymore. As I get older, my, the things that I delight in have changed. Uh, one of the things that I delight in is going to Wawa every morning and getting my cappuccino and coffee. And I delight in going there and getting my coffee and going back to my deck and sitting on my deck in the backyard on a nice sunny afternoon or morning and just relaxing and enjoying my cup of coffee. I delight in that type of thing. In fact, I look forward to it quite often. I delight in things like taking a walk with my wife, Cheryl. I really delight in playing a round of golf with my best friend, which is Cheryl. Not you, Joe, but my wife, Cheryl. I delight in spending time with her on the golf course. It's one of those things I really enjoy doing. I definitely enjoy and delight in spending time with my children. I delight in spending time with friends. See, as I see as I get older, I've seen my joys and my delights have changed a little bit. From the very active to the uh, not so active, but still things I choose to delight in. So I determined that joy comes in two, two ways. It can come in events. Events like a day off brings me delight, a day off from work. Maybe a cash bonus from work would bring me delight. Um, a new set of golf clubs would really make me joyful. 
uh, those types of shiny things that we like. Even the events of a, of a game that is won, like the Cleveland Browns finally won a playoff game last week. That brought me great joy, as some of you might realize and know that the Browns haven't been very good over the years. In fact, they had a winning record this year, and I was happy with that. And then they went to the playoffs, and man, that was, that was wonderful. And then they actually won a playoff game, and my joy went through the roof because of the Browns winning a football game. And by the way, I'm not the only one feeling that delight. You can ask Jeremy Walker and Pastor Kirk because their Buffalo Bills have won too. So I'm sure they're finding delight and joy in that event as well. The only problem with finding joy in events is they're not, la- they're not long-lasting. They don't last very long. They're short-lived. A day off, that means I have to go back to work the next day. A cash bonus, well, that cash only lasts for a little bit. And then I, uh, I long for another one. <laughs> uh, golf clubs, golf clubs are nice and shiny, and you really enjoy them for the first four or five years, and then all of a sudden you want a new set that hits, hit, uh, that maybe hits uh, straighter and longer. Or maybe, uh, and of course, obviously, they're more expensive. But then also, even though we may enjoy and delight in the big win, there's going to be those times when they lose as well. These are short-lived opportunities for us to, en- to enjoy something. But the second way in which we can determine our joy is through relationships. For instance, my relationship with my wife brings me great joy. Hopefully, your relationship with your spouse does the same thing. My relationship with my kids, when they call me or they text me or they just want to hang out with me, for no reason whatsoever, other than they just want to spend time with Dad, and they want to come over and spend time with Cheryl and I. That brings me great joy. Those things are last a little bit longer. And then, of course, spending time with my friends, and then ultimately having a relationship with Jesus Christ is the ultimate joy that we can have. Now, these types of things, the joys that we find in relationships They're long-lasting. They're not short-lived. Especially when we think of our relationship with Christ. Pastor Kirk talked to us last week about how God is full of joy. He is completely filled with joy. And that joy is at our disposal. We can have that joy. In fact, God wants to give us that joy. In fact, we need to find that joy in Him. But there's something problematic because some of us who have a relationship in Christ tend to view our relationship with Christ through the lens of an event rather than a relationship. In other words, we view our relationship with God on how He can give us things and how He provides things for us and how He fixes things for us, hoping that God would do this or do that. It gives us that false understanding of what it says in, and false interpretation of what it says in Psalms chapter 37. Whoa. Okay. And chapter, <laughs> that's okay, I'm all right. You can leave it go, that's all right. In chapter 37, verse 4, where it says, and he will give us the desires of our heart, which is always or seems a lot to be mis- misinterpreted by God's people as if he is some type of vending machine that gives us whatever desire we want and that we can go to that vending machine every day and pick what desire we want for that day and ask God and for somehow we have this idea that he would give it to us. So we need not to live there. We can't live in this, uh, this situation where we see our relationship with God as, as just something that he provides for us like a vending machine. He's not there just to fix things for us. We need to find our joy in having a longing um, relationship with him. And what that means. What does that mean? That we desire to have a deep, longing relationship with God. And that is what is going to bring us our greatest joy. Now, in order for us to understand what that looks like, I would like us to go to to Psalm chapter 37. Because in Psalm 37, Psalm chapter 37, verse 4, it says this, Delight yourself in the Lord, okay? 
The word delight there means to enjoy your relationship with God. Now, we're going to tear that apart a little bit later. But right now, I'm just going to, I, I, we need to, to unwrap this passage. In order for us to do that, we need to go back to verse 1. And we need to read what is the psalmist telling us in verses 1, 2, 3, and then when we get to verse 4, we'll have an understanding of it, what it means to delight in Him, what it means to delight in our Heavenly Father. Now, David is the writer here. He's the one who writes Psalm 37. We know that David is at the end of his earthly life. We know that because when we look over at verse 25, it says that, he once was young, but now he's old. Uh, that could be a definition of some of us as well. But we know that we're at the end of David's life. And David, in his experience and in his wisdom, is going to share with us one of the great dilemmas of our lifetime. And in fact, of all lifetimes. And the great dilemma that he is going to deal with is this. Why do evildoers prosper and the righteous suffer. Why do the evildoers continue to be successful and get all that they want, but yet those of us who are righteous have to suffer? Some of us have to fight for every dime we have. Some of us fight to even meet our bills and so forth. Why do evil men prosper while the righteous suffer? In, verse 37, verse, in chapter 37, verse 1, it says this, it says, do not fret because of evil men or be envious of those who do wrong. Interesting word. Stop your fretting. Don't fret. I, when I read that, I chuckled because it reminded me of the old western I used to watch, Gunsmoke. And if you ever watch Gunsmoke, Matthew Dillon was the marshal and he had a little deputy. His name was Festus. And Festus was a, a rough-looking guy, uh, and he didn't even ride a horse. He rode a, a, a donkey or a mule. And one of the things he always said was, well, quit your fretting. You know, you, if you read this, you might have thought for the first time that a redneck wrote verse 1 in Psalm 37. Quit your fretting. But no, it, it wasn't Festus. It wasn't a redneck. It was David. David said, do not fret. Don't worry. The actual word here, fret, comes from the English word fretten, which means, well, you can see it in a lot of translations. The NIV uses it, as obviously as we see here. The ESV uses it. The NASB uses it. Even the Darby translation of 1890 uses the word fret. Don't fret. Don't worry. It means, the very word means to devour. Don't devour. Don't allow this comparison uh, that you're going through with the evildoers to devour you. The picture of what fretting does is it eats away at us. It gnaws at us. It produces nothing positive in our life if we decide to fret. And then David says specifically the reason why we're not to fret. Do not fret because of evil men or be envious of those who do wrong. He says, don't fret over these people because if you do, you're only going to become envious. You're going to be full of envy and jealousy if you do this comparison thing. In fact, not only does it say that you'll become envious, if you look in verse, nine, uh, verse 8, it says also it causes you to do evil as well. If you continue to focus on these things, that not only will you become jealous and envious, but also it may cause you to do evil as not as well. So what the psalmist is saying here is that we need to keep our focus on the right thing. That if we don't, if we continue to focus on the evil doers and what's going on all around us, that doing that one thing is the one thing that's going to steal our joy. If you want your joy to be stolen, that's the fastest way in which to do it. Is to focus on everything else but accept what God is doing. The carrot of comparison is so easy for us to get involved in. It's always in front of us. We can look all around us and see 
that other people may be doing better, that the, that the evil, the, the unbelievers, the, the people who are not like us are doing so well, and why am I struggling? God, why don't you do for me what you're doing for others? And we begin to focus on those types of things. Unfortunately, we have this Adamic nature, which makes it so easy for us to do. Easy for us to, to do that comparison type thing. And maybe the year 2020 has brought this to light as well as the events that are going on even right now. When I think of what's going on in our world today, when I look at the politics, when I look at the hostility, when I, think, when I look at the anger, when I look at the deceit, when I look at the lies, when I look at all this stuff, it can cause me to, to be so wrapped up in those things that I focus on those things and I don't focus on the reality of what God has done in my life, the reality of who God is. David says in Psalm 16:8. He says, I will continually keep my eyes on you, Lord. I will continually focus on who you are, and I will not be shaken from this place. That is what we have to have that same type of resolve as David. David learned from his mistakes. And he has this resolve late in his life, at the end of his life, where he says, I'm not going to focus on those things anymore, Lord. Those things got me in trouble. I'm going to focus on you. And when we do that, when we focus on Christ, when we focus on God, then what we are doing is we're focus on, focusing on what is reality. What do I mean by that? David says, if you focus on these things, the reality is this, verse 2, for like the grass, they will soon wither, and like green plants, they will soon die away. The reality is this, that what the world has does not last. It fades away. And the real reality we need to understand is what we have in God lasts for eternity. It's eternal. Verse 9 says in the same Psalm, for evil men will be cut off, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. So he says, don't focus on all that stuff. Don't focus on what evildoers are doing. Don't focus on what our culture is going through right now. Don't focus on politics. Don't focus on all the stuff that's on Facebook and, and YouTube and Instagram and, and Twitter and all that stuff that's out there. He says, take your eyes off of that junk and focus it on me. And look at who I am. Focusing on God involves something else as well, as it says in verse 3. Focusing on God means that we have to trust Him. Look what it says in verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. I'm finding out that trusting in God is easy to say, but not always easy to do. But I also know that trusting in God has to do with the long game. It's not about what happens in the first quarter. It's not about what happens in the second quarter. It's not about what happens in the third. It happen what, what matters is what happens in the fourth quarter, that we win. So we trust in God because we know He is the winner. And when we put our faith in him and trust in him, we are on the winning team. He says, you trust in him. It's the, it's the idea that God will show himself trustworthy consistently and continually all the time. Through our lifetime. David devoted a whole psalm, Psalm 27, to the idea of trusting in God. It says this, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Who will I be afraid of? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident in God. That I will be confident in who God is. That I will trust Him with everything I have. No matter what. 
See, I call this the no matter what commandment. No matter what, I'm going to trust God. And no matter what, I'm going to continue to do good. Because when I have that type of attitude in me, I'm not focused on other stuff. I'm focused on trusting God. I'm focusing on what God has provided. I'm focusing on doing what God has called me to do. And when I'm busy doing what God wants me to do, I don't have time to focus on all the other junk that's going on around me. So therefore, trust God no matter what. Do good no matter what. It doesn't matter our circumstances. It doesn't matter what type of pain we're going through, whether it's physically or emotionally. It doesn't matter uh, the problems that we're facing at work or at home. It doesn't matter. No matter what, we put our trust in God. Our trust in God is not based on our circumstances. It's we just do it because we know He is faithful. And in fact, we have to have this will the will that we have to choose to trust God and to do good. It's the idea where we're going to say, I will enjoy the land in which God has given to me. Look what he says. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. So I will trust God and do good. I will enjoy what God has given to me. And I will continue to feast on God's faithfulness. That he will give us safe pastures. That we will continue to feed on God's faithfulness. I love that term. Have you been doing that? Have you been feeding on God's faithfulness? What does it look like to do that? You know, the men were praying. You know, a group of men that I, I pray with. We get together and we were praying the other night. And we were asking the question like, you know, how can Jane Nicholas, you know, man, she's gone through so much. What keeps her going? What keeps her and Bill moving forward? The same thing with Lowell and Carolyn. The same thing with Kathy Berry and her husband Henry. What is it that, that allows us to keep moving forward? What's, going, what's that one thing that's going to allow David to move from dealing with the death of his father. What's going to allow Matthew and, and Heidi Grab to move forward from such a horrific situation in their life right now? I can tell you the only thing that's going to allow them to move forward and do this is to find and to feast and to feed on God's faithfulness. That's the only way in which they can do that. And see, when we do that, when we are able to trust God and do good and feed on His faithfulness, no matter what, God does something to us. He begins to, to shape our hearts. He begins to change us. You know, I admit it's not always easy to do these things. It's not always easy to be faithful. It's not always easy to just keep doing the things you know you ought to be doing. Sometimes I don't feel like studying. Sometimes I don't want to pray. Sometimes I don't want to go to church. Sometimes I, 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 I don't want to worship. And it's those times when I don't feel like doing it, but I do it anyway, that I find a lot of times God does the greatest work in my life. You know why? Because I know who feeds my soul. God is the only one who can feed my soul. That's what keeps me going. That's what keeps me going forward. That's what allows me to keep moving to Him. It's Him. He always feeds me. He is always in this process of wanting to change my heart. And as long as I want to find and feed in His faithfulness, He will continue to mold me and change me to be like Him. Nothing else will do that. Nothing. 
And when we understand that, we then now can come to verse 4. Verse 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord. I really contemplated this word this week. What does it mean to delight myself in the Lord? By the way, it's a command to everyone who calls himself a follower of Christ. If you are a follower of Christ, you are to delight yourself in him, in him alone. The word delight here is the Hebrew word anag, not anag, A as in, well, it's N-A-A-G, anag, which means to enjoy something, to find joy in someone or something. And in this case, it's the idea of joining your relationship with God, to enjoy your relationship with Him. Let me ask you a question. How many, of, how many of you out there today, this morning, are enjoying your relationship with Him? Do you enjoy being with God? Because when I say, how many of you are enjoying your relationship with, me, with Him, that actually means you're spending time with Him. In order to have a relationship with someone, you need to be spending time with them. You need to be doing the things that you normally would do with a friend, with your wife, uh, with your spouse, with uh, whoever. If you have a relationship with him, are you enjoying your time with him? I have to admit, there's times I see people who are believers, who are followers of Christ, and they don't look like they're enjoying their relationship with him much. Do me a favor. Can I ask you to do something today? If you are enjoying your relationship with Christ... Put it on your face. Can you do that? Just put it on your face so people can at least see it. Man, if you're enjoying your relationship with God, and I'm not saying that every time something comes into our life, we have tough times. I'm sure right now it's difficult for some of these people who are going through difficult times to put the joy of their relationship on their face. I understand that. But you know, I remember what my young daughter taught me, Rachel. One day we were at a drive through and I was getting a little agitated because they were, so, they were taking so long. And she told me afterwards, she says, Dad, I just want you to know you, you weren't very kind. Or at least you didn't act like you were very kind to the people that you were dealing with. You shouldn't, you know. And, and, and I thought about that, and I thought about that, and I thought about that, and I really have changed, or I, I've, I've, I've tried to change how I look when I'm dealing with people when I'm agitated. Um, for instance, going to Wawa every morning uh, has been a challenge for me lately because Wawa is really struggling with employees. They don't have enough employees. So when I go there to get my coffee, it's not always ready or the machine isn't working right. So I've learned as I'm there who inside I'm being agitated, I've been reminded constantly to not show it. Because, simply put, getting my coffee fast enough isn't something that should steal my joy, right? And whether it's just right the way I like it shouldn't steal my joy. Those types of things, if those things are stealing your joy, then man, you got to deal with it. In fact, I've got to the point where I've changed my outlook at Wawa where I know how to fix the machine myself. And they, when they come in and see me, they say, good morning, Kevin, and they see that the coffee or the, the cappuccino's not coming out all right. They don't even come to me anymore. They say, Kevin's got it. He knows how to deal with the machine. Now, maybe one of these days I'll get compensated for that. That would bring me great joy, but I don't think I will. But the idea is, put the joy of the Lord on your face. But there's another... Um, explanation of this word. There's another definition of this word. It's not just the idea of finding your joy in your relationship with him. It also has this idea of being soft 
The word actually means to be soft or be, to bend toward or to be pliable. So maybe I can put it this way. When you come to God, don't be stiff and unteachable. Don't come to God with this attitude of pride where you think you got it all together, but rather be the exact opposite. We come to God with this idea that we come to him and we place ourselves in his transforming hand whereby he can mold us and make us into what he wants us to be. That's the word delight, that we are soft and pliable in the hand of God. That we know he's not going to do us harm, but rather he's going to make us into something wonderful. Silly putty and Play-Doh, when it gets really, really hard and you can't form it anymore, is useless. You just throw it away. Don't be like that. Rather, be soft in the hands of God. Be pliable. Allow Him to work in you. So we find a way in which we enjoy our relationship with God, and the one way we can do that is allowing God to mold us. Allow him to do the work in us. I have a friend at work. His name, uh, his name doesn't matter, but he came to me and he says, Kevin, and this was just last week. It's interesting how God brings things into your life. He says, Kevin, he says, how do you deal with the old life? He says, I, I just struggle. You know, I'm trying to move forward with my relationship with God, yet my buddies and all my old friends keep calling me and I'm struggling with, you know, what do I do? And I said to him, well, just for, a, if I just threw out a, uh, an answer out there, I'd tell you this. You need to learn to delight in God more than you need, than your desired delight in your friends. You need to find your joy in God rather than finding your joy in friends. Now, I just threw that out there, but then I said, that's, I can't, that's not fair. I didn't tell them how to do that. How do, you, how do you do that? Well, first of all, I tell them it's not easy. It's, sometimes it's difficult. But I ask them, I says, do you find joy in going into God's word? Do you find joy in God's word? He says, well, I'm not really reading it that much. I read it sometimes. Okay. Well, that's one way. How about your, do you delight in his presence? Do you, light, do you find your joy in being in the presence of God? He says, what do you mean by that? I says, well, how about your time of prayer? Are you praying? No, not much. How about worship? How about just being quiet before God? How about those types of things? Are you delighting in those things? This is the same question I ask you. Do you enjoy going to God's word? Do you enjoy being in his presence? Paul says, I delight in, in Psalm 1, 2. He says, I delight in God's word. In Psalm 119, he says, I continually do- delight in God's law, day and night. Some of us only look at looking at God's word as a job rather than finding our joy in his word. It's a delight in his presence. Paul says this in Psalm 63, God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in the dry and thirsty land. Do you long for God? Do you long to be with him? Do you delight in prayer? Do you find your joy in your times of prayer with him? And your prayer with other people as well. Do you delight in doing that? Or are all these things just, oh man, they're just the, the Christian things I have to do. If you want God to give you the desires of your heart, then you have to change what you delight in. God is the thing that we need to delight in. That's the key. If he changes what we delight in, then he gives us the desires of our heart. Look what it says in verse 37, verse 4. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. When we delight in him, he changes our heart to match what he delights in. So then when we ask for our desires, it matches up with his desires and he is delighted in giving us what our desires are. Does that make sense? It's all about what we delight in. That's what brings us our greatest joy. And then I found out something this week as we close. 
God delights in his children. Think about that for a moment. God finds great joy in us. When I was listening to Pastor Kirk's testimony last week in reference to the, his son who passed away, and I thought about him and Val and the family and the pain that it must have caused them during that time. I couldn't help but think that God was delighting in them. That God was finding great joy in them, even at this very difficult time. You know why? Because I remember what Pastor Kirk said. He said, we decided just to continue to follow him and to trust in him and see what Kirk and Val decided to do, what Pastor Kirk and Val decided to do, even during their time of great pain and sorrow, they decided that they were going to feed on the faithfulness of God. And when they did that, it brought great delight and joy to God. In Zephaniah, and I want to close with this, in Zephaniah chapter 3, one of those minor prophets that gives us a major lesson In chapter 3, verse 17, it talks to us about how God delights in us. Look what it says. It says, the Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. And he will rejoice over you with singing. In fact, God is so full of joy when he thinks about you, he has a song about you. He sings over you. And when I think of David, and when I think of Jane, and when I think of Lowell and Kathy, and when I think of the grabs, I think right now that God is finding joy in them. He is singing over them songs of joy. Find all of your joy in your relationship with Him and He will give you the desires of your heart because those desires are in tune with His. Feed on His faithfulness. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for making it clear to us in Your Word what we ought to do, what we ought to be. And Lord, even as I pray for these folks that we've mentioned this morning who are going through some very difficult times, I pray that you would continue to allow them to feed and to feast on your faithfulness because that's a feast that never goes away. Your faithfulness is always plentiful. It's a meal that is always there before us and something we can never, ever get enough of. I pray that not only for them, but I pray that for all of us here at Hope as we go through uh, uncertain times. Help us not to look at the things around us, but Father, may we focus on you, the one who gives us great joy. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Have a good week, Hope. Keep your eyes focused on him.